This video about tanks is rather ironically sponsored by World of Warships. I wasn't going to accept another sponsorship from World of Warships, but after some intense negotiations, my demands were met. <laughs> no, how'd a hot battleship like you end up in a little rinky dink like this, hmm? <laughs> now, a lot of people have been saying, Laser Pig, you're so sexy. But your ads are so long, and they're always interrupting the video, and I hear you. But unlike this video, my rent is not free. So we're going to do the ad now. Shut up and pay attention! Welcome back to Austin Tucker, Team Doctor. Austin Tucker, you might be the hottest doctor in St. Babe's Hospital for hot babes with minor injuries and tragic backstories, but that doesn't mean you get a make out with every one of your patients. Oh, don't worry, Pops. I only have eyes for Samantha now. Oh, Dr. Tucker, I know we've only known each other for 37 seconds, but something about those bajillion ab muscles makes you think you're the one for me. Oh, kiss me. Mm, 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 oh, kissy noises. Mm, mm. Oh no, Samantha, your lips. I'm allergic to you. Oh no, I'm going to die. Will Dr. Tucker Teen Doctor survive? How will the hospital survive his and Samantha's love? Find out more on... What are you watching this shit for? It's time for worship. Do you like boats? Well, now they're at war for some reason. Millions of them, all playing in spectacularly detailed, graphically stunning 12v12 arenas, ranging from the frozen north to Craggy Island. Doesn't make sense? Who cares? You're a battleship captain now. You don't have time for people logic. All you need to know that it's free and it's on PC. What's that? You don't like battleships? What are, what are you, some kind of nut? Hey, that's fine. We got destroyers, submarines, aircraft carriers, cruisers, tugboats, maybe. I, I don't know. Give it time. They're always adding something to the game. In fact, sign up now and take part in the new dockyard event where you can build the Puerto Rico. What's the Puerto Rico? I don't know. It's a battleship, I guess. I mean, I mean, just playing the game and completing challenges, you can earn this free tier 10 battleship that you can use to bring the pain in late game arenas or even in clan battles. What's that? Don't like people? Yeah, fair enough. You can play all by yourself against bots. It's okay. No one judges you for it. It's World of Warship. You're in a massive battleship. You blow the ever-loving crap out of other battleships. What more can I offer you here? But wait, there's more to offer here. Sign up now with the link in the description and use code LASERPIG and I'll give you a bunch of free shit. 500 doubloons, 2 million credits, 10 days of a premium, and better yet, your own choice of free ship. That's right! No more shall we be repressed by the hubris of man, dictating what one free ship we may have. Sign up now, code LASERPIG, link in the description, and choose between... The Cheyang, the, the Azukaze, the, the Kuma, Mayogi, or Osho? I, I think I'm saying those right. Like props to World of Warships for giving the guy who mispronounces everything but the hardest pronounced ships to give away. Thank you for that. Really cool. Just complete 15 battles, doesn't matter if you win or lose, and whatever ship you choose will be yours. Personally, I'd go for the Osho because it's the most expensive. I mean, unless you want to spend half the money I'm giving you free for it. I mean, up to you, I'm not judging. So play World of Warships because I play it and I need people to play with because I'm terrible at it. It's free, it's also on console now, so you've got nothing to lose! So go download it now! Anyway, on with the video. Ah, uh, French tanks. Love them or hate them, it doesn't matter. They hate you more. Of course, I'm old enough to remember a time when the popular internet amateur historian didn't think France had any tanks, or thought they were all hopelessly outdated, and that's how Germany swept the floor with them in the Second World War. Oh, you sweet summer children. Of course, now everyone is super into the Char B1 because it's god tier in various tank games. And what if I told you it has a bigger, meaner, more Frenchier, older sister who has a sort of mysterious mystery of mystery which surrounds her? I mean, obviously, I'm talking about the Char 2C, but pretend you didn't know that and I'll give you some sweets later. Intrigued? Well, keep watching and I'll explain in a bit after some mandatory explanation of history to pad out the running time of the video. <laughs> 
During the First World War, a number of countries began experimenting with tracked armoured vehicles, later to be known as tanks, and France was no exception. Developing armoured vehicles around the same time as Britain, their development fell unfortunately and very Frenchily behind. All tank projects were considered secret, and the development of one had largely been at the whim of one General Leon Marot. Now, he was aware the British were working on one, but neglected to give his own contractors, FCM, anything outside of a verbal communication on what to work on. So they did what all great French corporations do, accept huge payouts from the government for contracts, and do absolutely nothing. So the British get their tanks out first, and General Moreau is quite frankly pissed. He calls the Brits and asks if France could have, or at least purchase, some Mark I tanks, to which he receives no reply. However, the French peasantry, now having witnessed this new British invention, become curious as to their own projects to develop such a vehicle. So politicians start poking at FCM, and found that, well, they hadn't done anything. Thing. Words were said, but these words were in French, so I've absolutely no idea what they were. They're probably you got this bit con les petits, il a beaucoup de baguette, 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 <laughs> la gare. So Moreau takes full control of the project, and he remembers that Louis Renault had previously approached the Ministry of Munitions with a design for a tracked mortar, which had been rejected. But running out of options, he begged Renault to work with FCM to build something, anything, and reluctantly, Renault agreed. However, while FCM set about building this new heavy tank, Renault had secretly been working on his own tank project, and with this contract he now had the resources to finally complete it. Renault wanted a lighter, smaller tank which focused on mobility, but he wasn't blind to the idea of other tank types. In 1916, he conducted a feasibility study for a much heavier tank, and with British tanks still getting stuck in the mud, he quickly realised, according to himself, that any future heavy tank would need big, wide tracks, a well-built transport mission and a powerful suspension, and thanks to the study, Renault was able to produce a wooden mock-up of a heavy tank which featured none of these things, presenting it to the French government as part of his joint effort with FCM. The tank would be one of the most advanced to date, capable of carrying multiple machine guns as well as a massively heavy 105mm artillery. The French were impressed and they threw croissants at him. This new tank would be the most powerful and advanced weapon of war ever built. There was just one teeny, 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 tiny problem. Brigadier Jean-Baptiste Estine, who was now in charge of France's tank divisions, had been a key advisor on Renault's tanks project and had been sneakily listening in on everything going on. Now, he was in favour of returning to a war of mobility. He wanted those lighter tanks that Renault was building, and that was the problem. You see, the politicians and the public favoured the bigger, heavier tanks. But because France only had limited factories capable of producing tanks, there was a very good chance that these idiotic politicians would spend all of France's resources just building one massive tank. Estine didn't want this, so one night, by the light of a tiny candle, he writes to the commander of the Allied forces, General Joffre, in which he writes the following. Hello, baby. These people are idiots. Please help me stop them. I've tried poking them with sticks, but they still insist. I need your strong and manly arms. Your dearest love, Jean Estine. Oh. Now, while Joffrey admitted that giant tanks could serve a purpose if used correctly, he ultimately sided with Estine, though he had no power to cancel the project. Instead, he pressed that the priority would be to get tanks into battle as quickly as possible, and while the new heavy tank concept could take years to develop, Renault's new light tank was almost ready to be put in mass production. So a committee was formed to discuss how tank development should proceed in France. Do we go for heavy tanks, or do we go for the lighter tanks? But before I could even decide on what entrees to to serve at lunch, the French lost Bureaucrest, and with it, Romania. Already taking a heavy political flak for Verdun, Joffrey was forced out of office, in favour of the far less sexy Robert Novel. Was it Robert? How'd you say Robert in French? Uh, Le Robert Novel. Yeah. Now, he had his own opinions on tanks, and after learning of this heavy tank project, he was absolutely horrified because it would take resources away from his pet project, the Schneider CA. Oh boy. And so began a chain of events that only could ever possibly happen in France. 
In an effort to prevent resources being split into yet another tank project, General Moreau made a deeply tragic and somewhat unhinged political move. He'd support the Schneider tank project, but just to make everything fair, only if they split production with their main market rivals, the Compagnie de Foches Electriques the Company Marine Forges and Steelworks of Omgar, which had been financially struggling because France's naval actions during the First World War were somewhat lackluster, and honestly, they didn't need more ships being built, which was kind of their shit. You know, So, Pham agrees to start building tanks, but Schneider refuses to share the tank blueprints unless Pham pays for the entire production run of the 400 tanks on order, which they obviously refuse to do. So, to Moreau's horror, Pham start producing their own tank based on pictures they'd seen of the Schneider. With production resources now split between four projects, Moreau's dream of a French super tank felt like a lost cause. With Neville at the helm, France's first tank was the Schneider and its market rival the saint Chamond. Both were utterly useless. Because of the position of its gun, the Schneider can only shoot right. The space is so cramped that the crew struggle to breathe, and the entire tank is unventilated with the exhaust from the engine basically being pumped right into the face of the crew. In an effort to negate this problem, Schneider supplied the crews of cigarettes to mask the smell of the engine fumes, essentially turning the tank into a fucking hotbox, which A, prevented the crew from being able to see anything, and B, making sure everyone else could see them via the thick trail of smoke cranking towards them. The saint Shimon didn't really fare much better. In an attempt to one-up Schneider, Pham attaches this gigantic 75mm field cannon to the front of it. The gun makes the tank so top-heavy, the second it tries to cross a trench, the whole tank belly flops into the mud and then buries itself. In fact, the saint Shimon is so bad, crews are refusing to get onto them in the training fields, prompting one of the main training instructors to write to General Headquarters, declaring it had become impossible for him to continue attempting to train crews on the machine. Upon hearing all this, French Minister of Armament, Albert Thomas, immediately cancels all tank development and production programs, seeing them now nothing more as a waste of war resources. An expensive waste of war resources. War resources that could be made into battleships, and wine, and shoes for prostitutes. Both General Moreau and Estine write to him, and even briefly join forces in an attempt to convince Thomas to change his mind. A prostitute's shoes are not that important in a war. They can wear the less fancy shoes, it's fine, but his decision seems completely set in stone. The French tank project has been a failure, and France will produce no more tanks. End of discussion. Until Tomas goes on a diplomatic mission to Russia, where the prostitute shoes are very fancy. While he's gone, Moreau quietly orders the restart of all production programs, allowing his heavy tank production to go ahead, hoping all of this will fly under the radar. It does not. Tomas is furious, and on his return, he immediately banishes Leon to the realm of stale baguettes. And he, he, he fires him. He, he, just, he just fires him, okay? But by doing so, he's rid Estine of his biggest rival. Estine is now left to pretty much do what he wants, and he wastes absolutely no time at all. Meanwhile, the development team for this new French heavy tank are almost ready to put together a prototype, but there is a bit of a problem. The parts designed by Renault have not arrived yet. Renault claims they'll take another three weeks, he's stalling for time, because while all of this has been going on, Renault has been finishing his own tank project. Having learned by watching the mistakes from others, Renault's new light tank would need to incorporate a number of radical changes, and for that he's stealing resources intended for the heavy tank project. But in spite of it being pretty much ready for mass production, Tomas still won't greenlight the project. In fact, he's not greenlighting anything. But just then… America joins the war. America's entry into the war is largely a political one. America was on the brink of financial ruin, but the war in Europe has been an advantage. Being an ocean away, America has grown rich of the supplies of raw materials being sold to the Allied powers. But in spite of being officially neutral, President Woodrow Wilson wants to enter the war on the Allied side. For him and millions of other Americans, France is the home of democracy. It was the country that came to America's aid during its War of Independence and was officially its first ally. France is also heavily in debt to the US. and if it were to fall, Wilson fears those repayments would never be made, recreating the conditions for an economic turmoil. There's also a second reason. America has become a melting pot of different nationalities, ideologies, and so on and so forth, and they're not mingling particularly well. Wilson believes that by joining the war he can unite people against a common enemy, and that will fix all of America's problems, and from now on it will be nothing but people holding hands and singing songs from there on in.
So that doesn't work, but that's a different story. Anyway, in an effort to delay their inevitable defeat, Germany starts a program of unrestricted submarine warfare, allowing its U-boats to essentially blockade Britain by sinking any boat supplying it, including the American ones. And this naturally pisses the US off, so now they are part of the war. Britain and France send envoys to America. Now they have a plan. Rather than send wave after wave of their own men at the enemy, they're going to send wave after wave of American men at the enemy. But to do that, they need to convince the US to send troops. But who is going to command them? France says it should be them because, well, they are the ones leading the Allied force. Britain says it should be them because the language barrier and the food barrier would be somewhat lessened. The Congress isn't sure. But into this fray steps Commander Joffre. Remember him? Oh baby, he's back. Joffre had been used as a scapegoat for French failures, but with new French command proving equally, if not more, incompetent, Joffre is back on top, and a little revenge plot is boiling in that mind of his. See, Joffre has been sent to America as part of the French envoy. His superiors are expecting him to win favour with the US Congress and convince them to send wave after wave of American men at the uh, German machine guns so that the French will uh, stop deserting and thinking that maybe communism isn't so bad. Joffre spends four weeks on tour. In full view of the press, he's seen waiting patiently for a haircut in the slum district of St. Louis. He meets with the French immigrants there, visits the hometown of Abraham Lincoln, and lays a wreath at the tomb of General Lafayette. You Americans, of course, know who he is. You don't need me to explain your history. Lafayette, army commander during the Revolutionary War, helped you win the Battle of Yorktown, considered a national hero, there's a town in New York named after him. Ah, you know. Joffrey was quickly becoming a recognised household name. The press loved him. The public loved him. I love him. But this was all just a distraction. Before he'd left to go on tour, Joffrey had addressed the US Congress as an individual and had written a letter recommending the US forces be independently led, beholden to no one, and using their own supply. Now, Congress wasn't stupid. Well, back then they weren't. They were well aware of Operation America Meat Shield, so they went with Joffrey's recommendation. The US would enter World War I as an independent Allied force, under the command of all-American badass General J. Pershing. Now, Pershing was another who believed in rapid mobile warfare. He'd seen trench warfare played out in Europe and wanted to avoid it as much as possible. He'd also seen reports in the Battle of Cambria, where the British had used mass tank formations to crush barbed wire and suppress machine guns while the infantry followed him behind. Pershing believed that not only could he recreate this tactic, but improve on it, and for that he wanted tanks that were light and fast and not slow and cumbersome like the British ones. Thankfully for him, once he'd arrived in France, there had once again been a change of leadership. The morale of French troops was now at an all-time low. Desertions were frequent, and many troops were now refusing to march blindly into the meat grinders each battlefield had become. They needed someone who could unite them. And there is one man who might do just that. It's decided that all Allied forces should be placed under a central commander. And that commander is Philippe Pétain. Pétain was a national hero, unlike other French commanders who favoured the restrictions of the class system, keeping the peasants where they are and out of my bloody wine shack. Oh, disgusting, the working class. Why am I doing a British accent? These people are French. Mes dieu, this is the working class. Ugh, disgusting. My wine is superior. Your wine tastes like toilet water. Something, something like that. I, I don't know. I'll replace that line later. Unlike other French commanders who favoured the restrictions of the class system, Patan frequently visited the frontline trenches. He handed out cigarettes, drank the same wine, ate the same stew as the common soldier. The French saw him as an inspiration, a people's man, and as luck would have it, he too was in favour of faster, lighter tanks. He was also a good friend with Estine, and did not waste time placing him in charge of all tank production in France. But that wasn't to be the end of it. The public and those dirty politicians still favoured the heavy tank ideology, and what was worse, Pershing had ordered a number of Renault's new light tanks to form the backbone of America's first tank divisions. With Renault seeing dollar signs and the French politicians wasting time and resources on giant super tanks, Estine feared that the light tank he'd always dreamed of would be sold off to the Americans, and all French tank production would instead focus on delivering a single, big, dumb tank. Estine was not happy, but he had a plan. 
In a conversation with Bataan, he highlighted the importance of getting tanks onto the battlefield quickly, and how Renault's tank was ready to go, versus a prototype that could still take months, perhaps even years, to complete. Bataan sees Istin's point, but the situation has become somewhat more political. The public and the politicians are now starting to ask questions on why this new French super heavy tank was being delayed for so long. And what's worse, America had just offered 400 of the new tanks being designed in a joint project with Britain if France could at least just try to make an effort to getting at least one of their tanks ready. That would mean that this new war-winning weapon would be largely a British weapon, and France would get left behind. So out goes the anti-tank minister to Mars, and in comes pro-tank Louis Suchere. who immediately greenlights both projects. Renault's new tank rolls off the production line at speed, the Renault Char d'Assault Mark 18, better known by its post-war American codename French Tank Model 1917, or FT-17, the first tank with a fully rotating turret, and it is amazing. In spite of being smaller and less impressive than previous tanks, the lightweight and speedy design of the FT-17 means more of them quickly reach the opposite side and overwhelm the German defences. The speed of the French advance is staggering. But that heavy tank is still looming in the background, and questions on its existence are starting to be asked. Leutcher has greenlit the project, and Renault, who had been trying to ignore it, finally relents and produces the engines and gearboxes required. Bataan and Estine are not happy. They have the tank they want, and are desperately trying to push out as many as they can in time for a major planned offensive. For that, Renault needs all the steel he can get, and adding this 30-ton monster to the production line will slow down that supply. So they do as all good Frenchmen do delay production. Estine demands a number of major changes and then selects the largest and most impractical design for mass production, forcing the designers to return to the drawing board. Batan then demands that 400 be ready as quickly as possible, which is an impossibility. This creates a heated argument among the political leaders and the project becomes bogged down in delays. And by November 1918, peace breaks out. A ceasefire comes into effect on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month effectively ending the First World War. Though a treaty of peace will not be signed until the following year, the weird multicultural orgy of murder that is the First World War is effectively over. French heavy tank production is therefore cancelled. But there is still a lot of political pressure on the project to be finished. I mean, after all, it has been pretty costly. The newspapers have been hyping the project up for the public, and now we have all these factories that aren't really doing anything, so really, really, we should finish it. Estine sighs, dramatically. He is French, after all. And after a lot of Frenching back and forth, he finally agrees to a limited production run of 10 heavy tanks. Work begins. But being France, work begins slowly. Peaks around 2pm and then everyone takes their breaks and doesn't come back until the following day. But eventually, they do finish them. And while the FT-17 is probably rather unfairly remembered as the world's first modern tank, it will be this new tank, the FCM Char d'Assault de Grand Modèle, known more commonly as the Char 2C, that will carry the innovations of all future modern tanks. It is the first tank to feature a three-man turret with a dedicated loader, a gunner, a commander acting as spotter. It will feature a 75mm gun capable of firing both high-explosive and armor-piercing rounds, as well as a coaxial machine gun running parallel to the main gun, two-way radio communication between the crew, as well as a set of heavy, wide metal tracks, all things that would become standard in the Second World War. The Char 2C was the only super tank designed to become fully operational, and out of all the proposed designs, it was probably the most practical and the most modern. It would have a final crew of 12 and be one of the first non-specialist tanks to feature a radio as standard with a dedicated radio operator. Unfortunately, heralded by a stain and people like him, French tank philosophy would follow the footsteps of the F-17, which honestly I can't blame them for. The FT-17 proved to be World War I's most successful tank. It would go on to become the first tank of Japan, the US, the Soviet Union, uh, Finland, Estonia, Lithuania, Yugoslavia, Belgium, Czechoslovakia, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Greece, Sweden, and even Brazil. So it was only natural that French designers would choose to follow in the footsteps of their most successful tank, not the weird sister that no one wanted. So, Second World War French tanks like the Air 35 and the D1 would be built to be small, lightweight, and have a one-man turret with the frontal plates heavily up-armoured to try and combat the rising advance of the anti-tank gun. Our good friends at Samoy, who were responsible for the Schneider, redeemed themselves with the S35, one of France's most successful tanks of the period, though highly underrated given the shadow it's living in. The only tank which would come close to the technical innovations of the 
C would be the Char G1, an unfinished prototype for a medium tank which featured turret stabilisation, a semi-automatic gun loader, and an optical rangefinder, all things that were not really common on tanks until late model M4 Shermans. Of course, none of these would be finished by the time France fell, though once France was liberated, it was strongly considered restarting the project to create a fully independent French armoured division. However, by then, America was pumping out Shermans by the shipload, so there wasn't really much point. So instead, it was decided that France would attempt to produce a tank for the then unexploited heavy tank market, the ARL-44. So in an ultimate twist of irony, France's first tank since its liberation would be a heavy tank. Which honestly wasn't that great, though considering the French had to scavenge for paper to draw plans on, they did a pretty decent job. But what happened to the 10 Char 2 Cs? What is this mystery I keep alluding to? Well, after the First World War and having been lumbered with all these behemoth tanks, France wasn't particularly sure what to do with them. FCM fiddled around with the tanks until about 1923, when France semi-retired them, keeping two in a battle-ready state while the others remained in the shed. It wouldn't be until World War II when all 10 tanks were reactivated and pressed into service, forming their own unique division, the 51st, though their use never really ranged beyond taking propaganda films. By this point, the tanks were considered hopelessly outdated being large, slow, and with only 40 millimeters of armor protection, and yet they were oddly capable. All 10 tanks had radios, and an interlink communication with a central command tank having a dedicated commander capable of directing the whole unit. This was at a time when radios and French tanks were still relatively uncommon, and flak signals were still in use. A modernization program had begun in hopes of carving out some use for these tanks. Uh, the command tank Lorraine was up armored from 40 to 90 millimeters, making it the single most powerful tank in existence at the time if you only consider armour and weight as power. But it was to no avail. After the Germans broke through French defences, the decision was made to move the tanks to the south of France to prevent them from being captured. They were loaded onto a train and began a long journey south, but a burning fuel train blocked their path. And after a lot of Frenching, the decision was made to detonate the sabotage charges inside the tanks, destroying them. The Germans would find them a few days later as burning wrecks. FCM would attempt to build several more heavy tanks, including an attempted commission for a 600-ton tank capable of wielding a battleship turret. Yeah, that never went anywhere. But it it would never, none of these ideas would ever leave the prototype stage, save for the FCM F1, a dual turreted 139-ton monster truck of a tank, which was rush ordered in 1940. Instruction began, but was never completed. Anyway, that's all for me. Go away. Oh no, wait, the mystery! Right, right, sorry, sorry. So as it turns out, not all Char 2 Cs were destroyed. Tank number 99, Champagne, survived. Its charges failed to detonate, so when the Germans found her, she was in pristine condition. She was taken back to Berlin as a war trophy, and some debate exists as to where it was displayed. I mean, some sources claim it was positioned right outside the Reichstag, others, which are more likely correct, positioned it on Museum Island along with the two Mark V tanks I mentioned a few videos ago, alongside a T-35 captured from the Russians. If or not, the Char 2 C was reactivated and used remains a sub subject of debate. Not a huge amount of debate, I mean, there's, there's no evidence for it. But considering one of Germany's most effective weapons during the battle was two children, an artillery shell and a hammer, it isn't really much of a stretch to think it would have seen action. Either way, the tank was still there in 1945 when the Russians attacked the city, uh, though by now it had been very damaged. Berliners reported they could still see the tank until about 1948, when it vanished. And this is the mystery. What happened to Champagne? Well, there are two theories. The first, and most probable, was that it shared the same fate as the two Mark Vs. Russia famously stripped the city of everything it could get its hands on, including vehicles, but tanks were not something it was particularly after. Images of the famous Berlin scrapyard shows discarded German heavy tanks such as Panthers, Tigers, and even King Tigers. The two Mark Vs shared a similar fate. In spite of both these tanks originally being Russian war trophies captured by the Germans when Odessa fell, the Soviets didn't feel the need to reclaim them, and they were scrapped shortly after. However, there is evidence of this. Photographs of them being taken away, as, as well as a registry. I mean, the Soviets loved records. Thus, there are records of the Mark Vs being scrapped, yet nothing exists for Champagne. Enter Theory 2. Uh, this is the most popular theory. The reason no documents exist is because the tank was one of many vehicles scooped up and transferred to Koblinka, at a time a secret testing range for vehicles now a museum, and whose records are still largely sealed, though most of its exhibits have now been moved to the new Patriotic Park Open Air Museum, which allegedly has a miniature Reichstag for children to storm which I fucking love, by the way. Parts of Koblinka were never open to the public, including the famous Hangar 14, which was patrolled by armoured guards. It is a popular theory that this is where Russia keeps its secret prototypes, or the more modern vehicles it has captured from various NATO allied nations it won't admit to having. People also believe this is where they are keeping champagne. Now, 
is, well, within the scope of possibility, but why? What exactly does Russia have to gain by secretly goblin hoarding a century-old tank? Does Champagne hold some dark secret? Does the Germans install her with some advanced secret Nazi technology that everyone keeps banging on about? Well, the answer actually may be a bit more mundane than you think it is. Jablinka has something which it holds as a matter of pride, makes it unique from all other tank museums in that it does not show wrecks. All the tanks, all of them, are displayed in their original intended conditions, fully restored by the dedicated team of engineers. Now, Koblinka is not private. It is still considered an active military base and receives money from the government. The Russian government has set priorities on what funds are allocated and for what reason. And since every few months someone with a metal detector digs up yet another T-34, Koblinka has a rather long backlog of either Russian tanks to restore for the museum or for private collections. And since allocation of funds to restore Russian tanks takes priority for foreign vehicles, vehicles, there is simply not enough time, nor funds, to fully restore a gigantic old French tank no one's even really heard of, nor cares about. Especially since given the condition it's probably in, it would take years and millions of dollars to bring back up to museum quality. And the most annoying thing is, as time moves on, the likelihood of it actually ever being restored, or even being at Kablinka, steadily decreases. And yes, I, I have called to ask, but you would not tell me, even when I offered to buy it. Hello. I'm quite drunk, <laughs> and I'm going to explain why in a second. Okay, so I'm adding this part on at the end because, well, firstly, my microphone is working again, thank fuck for that, but because this final part was going to introduce a third theory, and that third theory is my own personal theory. I was going to go on and explain about how all the other theories generally don't make any sense, about how a lot of the information regarding those theories are basically woozles, just various websites repeating the same information over and over and over again, which largely comes from one misquoted source. And I was going to go over all the work that I'd done trying to find the Shard to see and the conclusion of where I thought it was. It was going to be a very behind-the-scenes look at the kind of stuff that that I do all day. Unfortunately, for reasons beyond my understanding, YouTube considered this part of the video a breach of community standards. I don't know why, but when I asked for independent verification, whoever reviewed the video seemed to agree with the bot. Now, <laughs> No, normally I wouldn't care about something like this, it just means I can't monetize the video, but the last time, the last time a video of mine got flagged by a bot for breaching community standards, which was me singing happy birthday to Sumito Media, YouTube decided it was a hate crime and deleted the video and gave me a community strike. And if I get too many of those, it's bye bye laser pig. So. <laughs> with the only valid appeals process being to, to start a Twitter account and, and make enough noise to attract the attention of YouTube's overlords. Which I'm not going to do, because I really don't want to have to make a fucking Twitter account. So I'm not going to take the risk. Uh, so right now, I'm going through that entire segment, I'm cutting it into sections, I'm uploading each section as its own private video, and I'm trying to find which part is triggering the bot, because YouTube obviously doesn't tell you, because that would make, that would make life too easy! Why would they do that?! <laughs> um, if I can work it out, if I can get this fixed, I'll re-upload that segment as its own independent video, and I'll go into a little bit more detail and everything else, and whatever. Um, second to that point, the karaoke I do at the end of each video. I'm sorry to say I'm not going to be doing those anymore. I, I, I enjoy doing them. I, I love doing them. People seem to really find them funny, but I think we all knew that this was coming at some point. YouTube has once again decided that me singing these songs are a violation of copyright and are considered a cover song, not a parody, which means half my income, which, you know, isn't a lot by the way, will now be sent off to these multi-mega billionaire record labels who plead poverty but refuse to give themselves the slightest pay cut. So a Patreon may be coming out soon. Turns out this is necessary to do, to beg people for money, and I'm just going to get over my hatred of having to ask people for money, so yeah, that's a thing. Uh, I had, I had three songs that I never got to use in the video. Uh, man, I feel like a woman, Hellfire, and the theme from Dexter's Laboratory. I, I might upload these to Patreon, to anyone who donates, uh, when I get around to making it, which might be ready now, who knows? Uh, I'll let you know. If, if, if there's a link in the description, it's ready. If there isn't, it's not. So don't, don't, don't harass me and say, where's your Patreon? If you don't have a link to it, it doesn't exist. Shut up! Anyway, so in the meantime, 
go play World of Warships. Code Laser Pig, get your free carrier. Or or the battleship, actually. Honestly, it's a good battleship. Pretty accurate, good armor. Really good for new players, if I'm completely honest with you. Anyway, uh, some boxes are going to appear. You can click on them to see the other trash that I've made. Click if you want, or don't. It's cool. I'm going to sit here and think of frogs. Nighty-night.